Hello and welcome to worship this day at Central United Methodist Church. My name is Amy Seifert. I'm the lead pastor here and I welcome you on behalf of the entire congregation. I would ask for you to please let us know that you are worshiping with us this day by leaving a comment in the Facebook section or the YouTube channel section uh, where you are watching this day. If anyone is worshiping with you, uh, please let us know that as well. And uh, we will be able to make sure that we, we know that you are here worshiping with us this day. As we prepare our hearts and our minds to worship, I would invite you to center yourself. Perhaps you would like to light a candle or have a cross in front of you, something that helps you uh, focus on the presence of the Holy Spirit with you this day. If you would please join us in our call to worship led by Pastor Liz Evans, the words will appear on your screen. Praise God who loves us all. Praise God who is full of mercy and compassion. Praise God who loves us well. Praise God who creates honesty and justice. Praise God who invites us to love. Praise God who loves through us and our actions. Would you please join me in our opening prayer? Loving God, Love through us as we worship your holy name. Love through us as we listen for your holy word. Love through us as we live your teachings and offer your love to our world. In your majestic name we pray, amen. Our opening song this day is All Creatures of Our God and King. If you would like to sing with us, the words will appear on your screen. As we enter a time of prayer, I encourage you to please watch your weekly announcements for joys and concerns. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. When we cry out with words that hurt, silence our cries and speak gently through our words. When we act in ways that hurt, even when help is intended, Transform our hurtful actions with your grace. When we forget that we are loved and called to love, love us back into your likeness, that your love might flow free freely through us and bring your love to the world. In your holy presence of love, we pray.
gracious and loving God, we call upon your name this morning, hungry for the coming of your kingdom in our midst. We crave change, O oh God, in our world, that there would be mutual respect and communication among nations, in our country, for justice and kindness to rule the day, in our community, for harmony and connections among neighbors, in our families and in our own lives. We pray that your love would so transform us that we would make justice, joy, compassion, and peace real and tangible in our world, our country, our community, in our relationships. We pray also for continued endurance as this pandemic continues, that we would know comfort amid our continued adjusting, that we would experience connection amid social distancing, that we would feel joy amid difficulty, that we would be kept safe and work to keep others in our community safe as well. We pray also, O oh God, for all those concerns that weigh on our hearts in our personal lives, for comfort and grief, for healing in sickness and injury, for peace in death, for connection in loneliness, for support in mental health concerns, for rest in the stress of school and work, for challenge and contentment. Be with us now, O oh God. Be our guide as we continue through this week. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy word. This past week, on January 27th, marked the 76th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Now, Auschwitz was the largest of all Nazi concentration camps, and according to estimates from the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., of the 1.3 million people deported to the camp, 1,082,000 of them died. Now, chances are many of us have seen photos of the camp. The actual structures are still standing in Poland. We might have seen pictures of the mass graves that were discovered by United States soldiers or pictures of the detainees who were still alive at the time of the liberation. You don't have to search very hard to find both written and video accounts of survivors where they describe the living conditions they endured at the camp. Those survivors living today still bear the scars of that ordeal, including the identification number that was tattooed upon their body. It would seem as though with all of the physical evidence available to us 70 plus years later, that no one would be able to legitimately, legitimately claim that the Holocaust never happened. And yet, people do. For many years, David Irving, who is a resident of Great Britain, was a Holocaust denier. He has been quoted as saying that there was no formal order from the Third Reich to exterminate the Jews, and that more women were killed in the back seat of Ted Kennedy's car at Chappaquiddick than were killed at Auschwitz. He claimed that the stories of the gas chambers were a fairy tale. And despite all of the evidence to the contrary, Irving was certain that the Holocaust never occurred. In 1996, he filed a libel lawsuit against American professor and author Deborah Lipstadt, claiming that her 1993 book about Holocaust deniers slandered him. He filed his suit in the United Kingdom, and there, the burden of proof lies with the accused rather than the accuser. 
So her legal team asserted that Irving had lied about the Holocaust. Now, if you're into biographical movies, check out the 2016 film Denial, which tells the story about this trial. I'm going to blow the ending for you, though. Irving loses the case. And afterward, he changed his tune about the Holocaust, saying that he believed that the Nazis were responsible for the murder of Jewish people. But as recently as just a few years ago, Irving claims that he's gaining support from people who have discovered his earlier claims, his earlier Holocaust denial theories, and believe them. So that's right, thanks to Irving, more people now believe that the Holocaust that killed more than six million Jews is a hoax. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about our words creating worlds and about how what we do and what we say have consequences. Now, we've seen this played out on our televisions and our, our news stories a lot recently. Because our words are so powerful, we have to be sure that our words are correct, that our words are true. That is what Paul is telling people in his first letter to the Corinthians. First, let's spend some time talking about what we know. Now, most of us like to think that we know what we know. What we believe makes up our identity. Our beliefs and our thoughts define us. But what happens when we discover that we might not know as much as we think we know? or if what we know isn't correct. What happens when something in life happens that contradicts what it is that we are so certain about? Our core identity is shaken, and we can risk losing our identity completely. I think this could be what the Apostle Paul is warning us about in verse 2 when he says, anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. Take a moment to bring to mind what it is that you know about God, what you know about God's nature, about God's word and what is meant by it, about what it means to have faith in God. Now, because you know it, these thoughts and ideas are what you consider correct. In fact, probably for most people, their correct thinking determines their faith in God. In other words, our faith is based on what we know about God. Our faith provides, or at least it should provide, the values by which we live and the map that we follow to live into those values. But life has a way of upsetting our thinking about faith. For example, scripture tells us that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Scripture says it, so we should know it, right? Yet every person can most likely think most likely think of an example where the righteous have received what seems to be a punishment and the wicked have had reward upon reward placed upon them. Knowing what you believe about God doesn't always cut it. Many lose their faith because what they experience in life doesn't agree with what they know. When our faith in God only stands firm, if we are right about what we believe, if what we know actually is what is, that is not a healthy faith. That's a problem, and it's sinful because it confines God to the limitations of our comprehension. We're confusing who and what God really is with what we think God is and should be like. Besides creating conflicts within ourselves when what we experience doesn't match what we know about God, being certain that what we know is correct creates conflicts for the church as well. Remember, 
that what I believe is what I know. And if there is a chance that what I know isn't right, that means I'm uncertain. And being uncertain can be scary. So we cling to beliefs and ideas because we don't want to consider the possibility that we might not know for certain what we think we know. Let's talk about a couple of battles that the church has fought. How old is the earth? Bible literists, literalists, those who believe that the Bible says what it means and means what it says with no room for interpretation, say that from using genealogies and from other statements in scripture, we count the number of years and earth is anywhere from 6,000 to 20,000 years old. Yet scientists have used physical tests like carbon dating to show that the earth is actually about 4.5 billion years old. Just like the Holocaust deniers, those who know that earth didn't exist prior to what is recorded in scripture, they deny physical evidence and cling to what they believe about the age of the earth. Here's another hot button topic. When I mention the name Charles Darwin, what comes to mind? The theory of evolution? Man came from monkeys? Ideas like that? In his book on the origin of species, Darwin concluded that all life forms are connected through a common descent and evolved through the process of natural selection, which states that all species will adapt to their environment in order to increase the possibility of survival for themselves and the future of their species. What people heard, even though Darwin never said or claimed it, was that man came from monkeys. This, of course, is ridiculous because we know that God said, let there be, and everything was created into existence. So for over 150 years, people have been fighting about something that was never actually said. Here's an important thing that we can't forget. The Bible is not a book of science chronicling the advancement of every species. It's a book of faith about how the species of humankind relates to God. The Bible is not a book of history which lays out dates and timelines for the study of the planet. It's a book about the history of God's people, the relationship between God and these people, and how he sent his son to teach them a better way to live. Truth, God's truth, isn't limited to what our minds can conquer or even what we are willing to accept. Because Holocaust deniers are unwilling to accept it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Just because we are unwilling to accept what there is proof for doesn't mean that that truth is not proof. There are several things that happen when we, as the people of God, fight over what we are certain about. First, we discourage people from becoming part of the body. In this age of enlightenment, where knowledge and information are readily available at the click of a mouse or a click of our cell phone, people are less likely to believe information that they know to be untrue. Second, we fall into a trap that Paul warns us about in verse one of our text today. Knowledge puffs up. Another name for this is the sin of pride. When you try to convince someone that what they know isn't actually correct, what usually happens? They insist all the more that they are correct. And sometimes they insist very passionately. Third, when we as the body of Christ fight over such things, it leaves non-believers and minimal believers with an incorrect idea of what being a Christian is all about. 
Scholar and theologian Peter Enns wrote a book titled The Sin of Certainty, and in it he says, in attempt to defend the gospel, backroom politicking, gossip, maligning people's characters, lying vengeance, even destroying people's livelihoods are excused as regrettable yet necessary tactics in their, in their holy to root out traitors, unharboring, traitors harboring unbeliefs. People see this behavior and it gives them a false idea of Christianity and they turn away from the gospel we are claiming to be protecting. In other words, we are doing much more to turn people away from Christianity than we are to attract them to it. Paul warns against this too in verses 11 and 12. By your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. When you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. That is a powerful admonition. And lastly, when we refuse to let go of what we think and consider other points of view, we are trusting ourselves rather than trusting God. When we are certain of what we know, we place ourselves as equals with God. There's a group in the Bible that did this. The Pharisees were certain that what they knew about God was right. And when God himself came to prove to them that they were wrong, they killed him. The fact is, only God gets to be certain. We don't because we don't see as God sees. So is there anything about God that we can be certain about? Yes. We can be certain that God so loved the world that he sent his son to save it. We can be certain that God wants us to go and make disciples for him. We can be certain that God calls us to love our neighbors. We can be certain that God wants to have a relationship with us. And we can be certain of God's love for each and every one of us. If we are to be certain of, any, of anything, let it be of these. How then do we keep from becoming Pharisees and get back to being disciples? First, instead of thinking and believing that everything you know is right, consider the possibility that you don't have a handle on God like you think you do and that you might have a few things to learn. The concept of God cannot be understood completely. That's why after thousands of years, people still strive to learn more about God. Second, be willing to risk your certainty about God. Acknowledge that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Rather than trying to prove that you are certain, that what you are certain about is correct, focus on loving others, where they are and how they are. Stop worrying about being right and start loving people, even if those people don't agree with you. Third, be willing to walk into uncertainty, scary as that might be. Struggling with our faith is normal and it is necessary. If we buy into the theory that God said it, I believe it, that settles it, we're settling for an immature faith. Our knowledge of and faith in God grows when we wrestle not only with what we are certain about, but also with the possibility that our certainty, our certainty, might not be God's certainty. Is this an easy task? No. Are we going to be uncomfortable? Probably. Is it worth it? Yes. Of this I am certain. Amen.
Thank you so much for your ongoing financial support of our church and its ministries. If you'd like to give, you can do so either by donating online on our website or by mailing a check to the church. At this time, let us pray for our gifts, our tithes and offerings. Holy, awesome God, we bring gifts of paper and coin, symbols of our gratitude and our love. Bless these symbols that they may become acts of love and grace. Bless us and our gifts that we may transform the world with grace and lo love. In gratitude and hope, we pray. Amen. Before we end our time of worship this day, I would like to share a couple of announcements with you. Uh, as you probably saw, if you received your weekly uh, update from our church office, we are going to continue to worship online for the next little bit uh, as we monitor the COVID test numbers here in Douglas County, Kansas. This is a situation that is changing. And so uh, if we are able to resume in-person worship uh, sooner than we anticipate, we will make sure that we let you know uh, by our weekly email blast that comes out. We will also have the information on our social media pages. And so if you are not receiving our email blast, or if you don't happen to be on social media, uh, we need your email address so we can make sure that we get this information to you. So if you would please call the church office and let this, uh, our secretary Janet know your email address, she will make sure to add you to the list that receives all of the information. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would also remind you that our ministry, Central Cares, is still active and operating. Uh, this is a ministry for people who need someone to talk to uh, if they're having a hard time uh, during these days of pandemic. And so um, if you feel that talking with a counselor would help, uh, please call the church office and we will put you in touch uh, with Dr. Richard Nelson, who is uh, running that ministry right now and he would be happy to visit with you. Another reminder that we are updating our church directories and so if you have had a change in your physical address, in your email address, a change in phone numbers, whether you've added one or got rid of one, uh, Janet needs to know that information so please call or email the church office to uh, let her know of those changes that will ensure that our church directory will be as up to date as we can have it when it is printed. And finally, we are rapidly approaching the season of Lent and our worship theme this year for the season of Lent is worship in the wilderness. We have been walking in a wilderness, it seems like now for oh about a year as we have been dealing with COVID-19 and so we're going to discover what the wilderness and more importantly worshiping uh, in the wilderness can teach us about a closer walk with God and a closer walk with Christ. Ash Wednesday is February 17th and so I uh, would ask you to uh, be on the lookout. We will send more information out in the coming weeks of how we will be celebrating uh, this season of Lent and how we will be worshiping in the wilderness. Our closing hymn this day is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. I invite you to sing with us. The words will appear on your screen.
And now receive the benediction. Go now to love as beloved children of God. Go now to live as living signs of Christ's presence. Go now to transform the world with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you soon. Thank you.